Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for, for being here. Um, and welcome to the Search and Matching Macro and Finance uh, webinar series. Um, so today we're very happy to have Daryl Duffy presenting uh, his paper, Aumenting Markets with Mechanism. Uh, let me just go a little bit over our format. Uh, we are going to have a 60 minutes talk followed by a 15 minutes Q&A. You can ask Q&A using the Q&A feature at any time during the talk. Uh, we, if, if it's a clarifying question, we are going to try to bring it up for Daryl. We also have Sam and Tio uh, answering questions uh, in the Q&A feature. Uh, we also are going to have an amazing list of panelists that to join us and, and, and they will be able to, to, to ask questions live and hopefully uh, uh, this will make a, a, an interesting talk. And thank you again, Daryl, for joining us. Uh, you can start. Uh, thanks so much, Bruno. And uh, thanks, Zach, and all the other organizers for uh, putting this together. It's a great opportunity. And as you said, Bruno, it's an amazing list of, uh, of panelists that you've pulled together. It, se it seems like uh, essentially all the leaders in the field are, are here today. Uh, what I want to do is um, I'm going to share my screen and tell you about this work. It says you cannot share a screen while the other participant is sharing. Okay, good. Uh, okay. One moment while I find the uh, right slides. Okay, Bruno, can you confirm that the slides are up? Yeah? Yes, they are. Okay, good. So as you can see from the title slide, this is joint work with Sam Entel at Harvard Business School. Uh, we've been working at this for a while and we've made a lot of progress uh, with the results. There's still a chance to take advantage of your comments today uh, as we get this thing published. It's about the structure of financial markets in which uh, there's exchange traded assets uh, but at the same time, uh, there's, there are side exchanges going on using other forms of mechanisms. We're focusing on size discovery mechanisms. Uh, and we're looking at the allocative efficiency of having these uh, side trading mechanisms uh, and whether or not it's good or bad for um, uh, market participants. And uh, the, the details will become more apparent as we go uh, through time. The motivation for this work goes back to some work by Dimitri Vianos in 1999, uh, which illustrates that large market participants delay the execution of their trades in order to reduce price impact. Because if you have to sell a million shares, you're definitely not going to send them to, you, to the exchange all at one time. You're going to shred your order over time and possibly across exchanges. Subsequent work uh, by Rustek and Waretka, Martsena is here today, Du and Ju, and some work I did with Haoshang Ju, uh, basically extends this idea and looks at some of its implications. As you can see from the illustrated diagram, this is actual output from the paper I did with uh, Haoshang Ju. If, you, if the seller starts with a million and a half shares and the buyer starts with um, two million short that he wants to get rid of, uh, instead of just exchanging instantly, which would improve the position of both and uh, save carrying inventory costs for a long time, um, they dribble out their positions over time and uh, that, that's costly delay. What you'd rather see is to have them make a, uh, an instant trade. Uh, an example of an instant trade um, is Workup, and this is a method that's used for about half of uh, on-the-run treasuries trades, so fi around 50 billion a day. And let me just illustrate how this goes. So um, let's suppose Martsena is the buyer and I'm the seller uh, in the initial round. The price is frozen at, uh, at the initial uh, point at, of time. Uh, it's lifted from the uh, central limit order book. So maybe the price is 99 for this particular treasury security. And uh, as soon as that price is frozen, uh, Martsena launches an order to sell at that fixed price of 99. In this case, she's able to execute, um, looks like about seven and a half million of her buy order. Meanwhile, 
I'm lucky enough to get in the queue and execute about 4 million of sell orders. This is all at that same frozen price of 99. So neither Martina and I nor I are suffering from any price impact costs. And in this particular uh, size discovery protocol, another seller can come in at the same fixed price, uh, take another couple of million, and then another seller can come in. Eventually, Martina's buy order is exhausted. Another buyer comes in and so on until everyone that wants to trade at the fixed price of 99 as, is finished. And then some people get rationed because they uh, come in too late. That's one possible scheme for doing um, a trade away from the central limit order book at a fixed price, uh, which seems like a great idea. And uh, in fact, it's, it's so appealing. You could say, how could anyone not, not like this? Um, because a whole lot of trades are getting done at fixed prices with no, with no price impact. It's encouraging uh, people to trade immediately rather than wait. And the, and the answer that uh, Sam and I um, are now um, um, demonstrating in the model that I'm going to describe today is that this is great when it happens, but what about the effect on exchange uh, market liquidity uh, that's caused by the presence of these size discovery sessions? And there's basically two stories to that impact. Number one, a lot of uh, large investors are going to wait until the next size discovery session before they try to execute. And when they're waiting, exchange is not getting done. And moreover, the order book is less deep because they're waiting. So that's bad because it's slowing down um, allocations. And that's in our model, that's just basically uh, an even trade. What you lose by waiting, you gain by this um, efficient scheme when it's run. This particular scheme is not fully efficient, but we'll discuss alternative schemes that are 100% efficient when they're run. But there's another disadvantage, uh, which is when this scheme is run, it's run on the fixed price that's set in the exchange. And now investors are going to be thinking, well, I uh, better lay off even more on exchange trading because I want to buy a lot. That's Smart Sena saying, I want to buy a lot the next time that the size discovery session is run. And if I try to buy in advance of the size discovery session, I'm going to push up the price and then the fixed price that I get is going to be worse. So she's going to lay off for an additional reason. And the combination of those two reasons means uh, that in a very um, uh, wide range of types of size discovery session, the net effect is negative, not just for average social welfare, but for every single uh, trader in the model. So that's the bottom line of the paper. And if you uh, decided wherever you are in the world that it's time to get lunch, dinner, or breakfast, uh, you, you got the message and you don't need to stay till the rest. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time and talk about size discovery in practice. So first in the treasury market, as I mentioned, uh, size discovery is very popular. Roughly half of all of the exchange based trade, which is only in the interdealer market, happens by size discovery using that same protocol I just described. In the swap market, again, around half of all interdealer trade volume is done by workup. And by the way, the interest rate swaps and treasuries market, there is no exchange on the outside of the interdealer market. In the credit default swap market, some work by Colin Dufresne, Junga, and Trolla shows that about 70% of CDS index trade volume is done by size discovery methods. So this is not a minor feature uh, that you can just say, well, it's an arcane detail that somewhere in the plumbing of markets that doesn't happen very much. This is a major effect. Equity markets um, use size discovery much less, but still significantly. Uh, dark pools are the primary example, and I'll give you uh, some results based on dark pools uh, in a few minutes. But roughly 15% of trade volume is done in dark pools. There's a number of papers that analyze the effect of that. There's other forms of size discovery that are not as well known that are also done in the equities market. So broker dealer internal crossings and then mutual fund 17A7 exchanges. That's when the sponsor of a mutual fund family of funds 
trades between the different funds at the fixed price that was set on the exchange. So these are all examples of situations in which uh, given that size discovery is available, it's advantageous for market participants to use it because they get to avoid price impact. You might think, well, given all this, uh, what I've said so far, there's scope for regulation. And indeed, in 2018, MIFID II regulations in Europe put a cap on dark pool trades of equities. 8% uh, for aggreg aggregate dark pool trading in, uh, in the um, uh, EU uh, uh, area, and 4% cap for any particular trade volume. I'll come back later and discuss the implications of those trade caps. They have not been successful, however, because the, they've essentially pushed the dark trading into other venues, but not back onto the exchange. So um, practical considerations, basically, this is a very predominant practice. It's not as dominant in equities markets, but it's still significant enough that it's caused concerns and regulatory uh, action. And uh, we want to examine um, the allocative efficiency of this practice. Um, there are different views. It's pretty controversial, in fact. So if you were to ask um, the head of a multilateral trading facility at UBS, uh, uh, I'm, my gallery is blocking my own view here. <laughs> Let me see if I can just move this out of the way. Yeah, so uh, the reality is we see that uh, market participants, it, it, uh, uh, lit venues are often not the best place to trade. So other venues have come into the marketplace because we are still committed to getting the best outcome for our investors. So this makes sense. You're gonna get entry by size discovery platforms because the mar individual market participants do want to trade on those platforms when they're available. The question is, um, if they're not available, um, is, it, <laughs> is it good to introduce them? Our answer is, at least in our model, no. Wow. Well, um, there are some, have been some comments on the MIFID II dark trade regulations. And uh, I think I'll just leave you to read those comments. I, I think you can read them faster uh, than I can uh, repeat them. Uh, but ultimately, the exchange operators are on the op opposite side of this debate. They're saying, well, no, don't, <laughs> don't introduce these size discovery platforms because they're detracting from market depth uh, and price discovery on the lit, the lit platforms, the exchanges. And as I mentioned, some research by Johan Putnins, Sagada, and Vestida has shown that this double cap rule in the EU has been evaded. So we're kind of in this um, period of time in which size discovery is very large, possibly growing, and yet um, there's not really a clear path forward on policy. As far as empirical evidence, in the equities markets, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that all the empirical evidence is strongly supporting our results. There's a mixture of empirical evidence on whether uh, size discovery actually could help, uh, could harm, or it's difficult to say. Uh, there's a nice, for example, I'll single out one paper by Farley, Kelly, and Puckett, uh, who show no significant effect uh, of a change in regulation uh, that would have the incidental effect of increasing size discovery. And that's on the performance of equity markets. There's a lot going on in markets like equity markets that are related to asymmetric information about the asset performance. And our model does not include that. Uh, Sam and I are focusing on situations in which the asymmetric information is about how much you want to trade rather than about what will the asset pay off. Uh, so do take our results with a grain of salt with respect to assets like equities where there could be a lot of private information about the asset payoff. Here are, here are our main findings, and then I'll dive into the model. So first, uh, size discovery is indeed 
uh, as promoted by the platforms that provide it, highly effective for avoiding price impact costs and can dramatically improve allocations whenever it's run. However, the prospect of having a size discovery session reduces exchange market volumes and depth. The net effect, at least in our model, is a reduction in overall allocative efficiency. Ex ante, every investor would strictly prefer an economy in which there is no size discovery. And um, at the end of our discussion this morning, I'll talk about some of the industrial organization issues that suggest a possible market failure there related to entry of size discovery platforms. So here comes the model. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion that follows. Once I finish the model, I'm only going to have one slide of wrap-up discussion, and then we'll, we'll launch into uh, a, a broader discussion. So in the model, exchange trading starts at time zero. I'll give you the, the trading protocol on the exchange, but it's a double auction. And then at random times, there are size discovery sessions. Um, Analogous to the ones that I've seen, I'll give you four different examples of how these size discovery sessions are designed, but they're all, they all have the property that they're extremely efficient. They immediately return the allocation to the efficient allocation. Then exchange trading starts again. Uh, in the meantime, there are random disturbances in the positions of the individual investors that motivate trade. So you can think of these investors as for example, dealers that are handling large customer orders that, that bump their inventories out of line and they want to trade again. Then there's another randomly sized, uh, randomly timed size discovery session and so on. And then eventually the asset pays off. Darren, I have a, a question about uh, size discovery in, in practice. Uh, are those sessions occurring at fixed time or at chosen time by investors in practice? Are these time? Uh, it's a, great, it's, it's a very appropriate question. Um, so first of all, um, our model uh, picks the easiest possible timing, which is random exponential time so that you can uh, develop a stationary model uh, or time homogeneous model. But in practice, they can either be held at fixed calendar times or whenever the exchange platform operator thinks it's about the right time, or in some markets when a market participant thinks it's about the right time. Uh, so they're most often they're randomly timed, but um, a weakness of our model is for us, they're exogenous random times and in practice they're endogenous random times, which we looked at and we don't think we can solve. But do you think the welfare result could be uh, impacted by the choice of time? It could be. I mean, could, least, I guess it suggests that if we're if a planner were choosing the time for everyone, it would choose an infinite time. And uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, we actually show that the best time to have it is never. So an infinite an infinite time would be uh, ideal. <laughs> but uh, but more seriously, uh, yeah, I think our results would change. However, I don't know exactly how they would change. Uh, it's definitely the case that the two forces I described are gonna remain. Those two forces again being, I wanna delay my trade until size discovery happens, that's bad. And the second one is, I don't wanna trade much on the exchange because I could push my size discovery price against me because the size discovery platform is just gonna use the exchange price. So both of those are always gonna be present. The question is quantitatively, will there be something about an endogenous uh, timing effect uh, that could cut away from those results or imply something different. And I honestly, it's a very, very complicated problem because as you imagine, it's an optimal stopping problem combined with two different exchange trading mechanisms. Uh, so we were not, uh, we were unable to solve that. Daryl, can I, can I just build on a, a sort of an, a, sure. an additional question? Part of what you've structured here is sort of a forward looking impact, but in equity markets, what happens in crossing networks is that people discover, as in your little example up front, that actually they didn't execute, right? That there's too many buy orders, for example, and uh, they're trying to buy and there aren't enough sellers. So there's an overhang 
that goes into the market. So when you set up your algo, you first check the crossing network. And then if you don't execute, then you know that you're on the wrong side of the market. And that induces you to train more quickly in the exchange market because you know you're not the only one, for example, who wants to buy. I'm not sure I saw that in your mark in your model. Is is that in there? It's in there. Um but it's in there in one case in a degenerate way, and in another case, it's, it's genuinely there. So the main results are based on a size discovery session that is so amazing that there is no overhang. That is, you still want to trade more, but you've reached the efficient allocation, and you, it's common knowledge that, um, that um, the allocation is already efficient. So there's not gonna be any extra opportunities after the market reopens for anyone to lay off excess inventories that they couldn't have laid off anyway. And, um, you know, that they can't lay off anyway because it's an efficient uh, situation. This, but however, uh, Sam and I did look at um, a setting in which we artificially impaired the size discovery mechanism so that we had exactly what you described, unmet excess demand that could have been executed in an, uh, a more efficient market, leaving the investors uh, with the desire to continue trading afterwards in the exchange market. And the results are essentially the same. I'm not going to go into details, but it doesn't Carol, seem to carry the effect. Carol, can I ask a completely orthogonal question, which is, sure, uh, so this is a private values uh, setting. So there are these results in uh, market design that suggest these Wickery type pivot mechanisms would achieve efficiency. Would your, uh, is it possible that your setting is related in some way to these kind of more abstract results because you have kind of more institutional setting in some sense? Yeah, uh, so there's a big literature on mechanism design. In, um, I think you're thinking of the Vickery Clark Groves. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sam, you investigated the sense in which, uh, if, you're, if you're available, Sam, the sense in which our results are um, consistent with the VCG mechanisms. I think you're more familiar with that than me. Do you want to comment on Vish's question? Sure. Uh, so basically we show that if there is no exchange market, then something like VCG run continuously can achieve the efficient uh, allocation. Um, but as soon as you introduce uh, an exchange market that's going on at the same time as these size discovery sessions, then you're sort of outside of that standard private values framework. Uh, and that's kind of where our model jumps in. I'm gonna push ahead in the interest of time, but uh, feel, anybody feel free to interrupt as we go forward. I'm 25 minutes in, we've got 35 minutes to go and we're, we're roughly on time, but I'm just gonna keep going ahead. So this is just to illustrate graphically some numerical output from our model so you can get an intuitive feeling for what's happening in our model with and without size discovery. So the, this, there, in this little example, there are 10 large traders um, that can trade on a platform or at size discovery sessions. I'm illustrating the positions of two of those traders, Mr. Blue, and Ms. Red. Mr. Blues obviously starts uh, with a large position uh, that he wants to sell and Red wants to buy. And shortly after time zero, a size discovery session allows them to achieve an efficient exchange. They end up on the thin black line in the middle of the diagram, which is the efficient market allocation. Then uh, those bold colored uh, lines start to diverge again as their positions get pummeled by uh, various, uh, let's say, customer orders that are moving their inventories around. And then uh, at time, around time 680, this could be in seconds, another size discovery session zaps them back to the efficient allocation, and then they diverge again, and so on. The thin red and thin blue lines are the allocations that you would get with only exchange trading. And you can see that the, with ex, only exchange trading, um, you, there's some wandering around, but you're staying 
well, I don't know if you can tell from this illustration, you're staying uh, somewhat closer to the black line because you're there's more aggressive trading when everybody knows there's no point in waiting for a size discovery session. It's not going to happen. So we may as, well, may as well get to business and start reducing our inventories. Um, now, you, maybe you can't get it uh, from this illustration, but the no exchange, the no size discovery allocation is more efficient than the size discovery allocation. Now I'm going to get into the algebra, uh, algebraic uh, representation of what's going on. So first, I'm going to explain how size discovery works in a static setting. And then I'm going to layer that into a dynamic model. So we, we need at least three traders. They start with some initial excess inventories. So these positions are measured in excess of where these uh, trader, trading firms would want to be. So ZI0 is the ex excess inventory of trader I at time zero. And we'll also keep track of the average excess inventory. In fact, because our traders are all symmetric, uh, the efficient allocation is everybody holds the average inventory. It will turn out in our dynamic model that the continuation indirect utility for trader I depends on that trader's current excess inventory position, ZI, and the average excess inventory in the market, Z bar. And that Z bar is a state variable, uh, except in the sense that trader I doesn't actually know what Z bar is. In fact, nobody knows at least directly what the average inventory is. That's a key source of asymmetric information. So only the traders only know their own inventories and whatever they've learned from prices and past uh, trades that they've executed. So uh, with that, yeah, Tar question? Yeah, Daryl, hey. Um, so is a trader I taking an expectation on that because he doesn't know Z bar? Uh, that's, you can think of this, uh, well, it's going to turn out in our equilibrium that trader I can figure out what Z bar is from the, from the exchange price. All right. Um, but okay. for now, you can think of it as a conditional expectation. If I knew what Z bar was, this would be my indirect utility. Okay. And without getting into details, um, because of the way that we've set up the model, which I'll get into later, it turns out to be linear quadratic in the trader's uh, own position, ZI. Uh, and the quadratic part of it is based on the square difference between that trader's position and the aggregate average market position. Hmm. And as I mentioned, the unique efficient allocation, just um, um, from, you can see it from these indirect utilities, is just to have everybody at the same position. But of course, they won't trade to that position because of price impact concerns. They'll just hmm. strategically avoid trading. So, it, it, can, is it possible to give us an intuition for the uh, beta of, of Z bar? Why does my utility of ZI depend on Z bar? Uh, well, there's different ways of thinking about that. One is uh, that your, the value of your inventory depends on the market price. Mm -hmm. And the market price depends on the allocation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, I think that's the easiest way to think about it is that mm -hmm. beta of Z bar is a reflection of market values. Uh, and that'll all, this will all be endogenized a little bit later, but right now we can just take this as, take it as a given in a static setting that these are the utilities and let's explore what, if these were your utilities, how would you set up a size discovery mechanism, uh, in which individuals report, um, they send messages about what they would like to trade. Uh, and we're not relying on prices. And then later we'll embed this in a market setting. Thank you. So here's the, sat the static size discovery game. Uh, let's suppose for the moment um, that the average uh, uh, inventory in the market is publicly observable. And uh, as I said later, we're going to exploit the fact that prices will reveal that. Trader I submits some inventory report and given those reports, some mechanism assigns a cash transfer to trader I and an asset transfer. Uh, and then the traders are going to be solving uh, a game. 
a, their best response in a game in which every trader maximizes conditional expectation of that trader's indirect utility for continuing from the initial position plus the asset transfer, given the messages, plus the cash transfer. And uh, that will turn out to be the right thing to do once we embed this in a dynamic game. And the solution to this game um, uh, well, an efficient uh, design, it's not the solution, it's one efficient uh, solution to this game, is to set up the asset transfers that literally give everyone the same position after trade. So everyone gets the average position as reported, the reported average position, less their own reported position. And of course, that means if everyone reports truthfully, um, everyone will come away with the efficient uh, allocation. And then the cash transfer, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into great, de great detail on this. The cash transfer in this particular scheme is linear quadratic. And the initial term is the one to focus on. Uh, it represents uh, the linear compensation at a frozen market price. And then the other terms are basically there to provide incentives. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to belabor this. This seems a bit artificial. It's not exactly like a real size discovery mechanism in practice. However, it has certain efficiency properties and we're not relying exclusively on this mechanism. We show also, and I'll get to that, that traditional size discovery approaches uh, can be substituted to get the same final results. Of course, you want your mechanism to be budget feasible and this particular mechanism is budget feasible. Okay, so now some results for this simple static linear quadratic mechanism. The one that, uh, the one that this particular mechanism um, uh, should be high, the, the feature that should be highlighted is that it's strategy proof. If you pick these coefficients of the cash transfer scheme appropriately, and there are unique coefficients with this property, then it's a strictly dominant strategy for every investor to report uh, their actual position. Um, it's also important, of course, that everyone uh, wants to participate. Well, it's the second bullet point. It's uh, ex post individually rational. And then finally, by construction, it's an efficient allocation. So this scheme has some very attractive features, um, but it's not the only scheme that will work in practice. So now I'm going to finish the remaining primitives of the model, and then uh, discuss the implications. Uh, so first of all, in order to promote continuing demand for uh, trading services, every trader's inventory is going to be shocked by some noisy process called HI. And all we need is that HI is an IID increments process, meaning a Levy process uh, with zero mean. It's a martingale. At some random future time, the asset will pay off some independently distributed amount with some mean V. An alternative is that um, the exponential parameter R is, um, is used simply as a time discounting. You, you trade until infinity at a, and there's time discounting at the rate R. Here's the, probably the weakest assumption of the model uh, well, the strongest assumption, <laughs> meaning making the model uh, least appealing, um, but making it also tractable. And that's the Almgren Chris holding cost model. So our investors don't have traditional risk preferences. These, you should think of these as broker dealer firms that have uh, balance sheet costs for holding excess inventory, which are quadratic in the excess inventory um, as illustrated. Now, the spirit of the conclusions, uh, the, direction, the, the directional results, as I mentioned earlier, follow basically from uh, this, this cost function being convex and symmetric, but the, the, the actual uh, explicit results depend heavily on the quadratic form of this excess inventory process. So if you were to attack um, this model as being overly restricted, this would be a good uh, place to attack. Uh, the bottom line is if there were no trade, 
then every investor would have the uh, initial utility, which is the expected final payoff of the position of that investor minus an inventory cost, where the position at any time with no trade is just the initial position plus these inventory shocks. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to layer in trading in two forms. First, exchange that, trading, and then size discovery trading sessions. Is there a that, question? That, yes, please. S -s Stop me if, if, I'm too, if I'm boring you too much. Not at all, um, no. So I guess the, 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 the closest possible um, kosher utility function would be to say that the, the, the agents consume at time tau and maybe they have something like a quadratic utility from consumption at time tau. And so this would, I guess, give almost the same equation except that the square instead of being inside the integral would be, the whole integral would be squared, right? That's right. Uh, and that's why it's, and it's difficult to turn this into a traditional preference model. There have been attempts, including by B and, and other co-authors, uh, to put a structural micro foundation under this model, and so far not successfully. There is a paper by Pierre-Colin Dufresne and a co-author that, uh, get, that gets something like this in a different uh, context using recursive utility of a certain form. Um, but I don't want to misdirect anyone that this is a natural risk preference model for a risk averse investor. It is a reasonable model for a corporation that has excess inventory holding costs. I see someone is now uh, using a leaf blower outside my window. I'm going to go close the window. Hang on. That's one of the, the additional hazards of the COVID crisis. Okay. Um, now, first the exchange and then later is size discovery. What is the exchange? This is a demand function so that, submission. Can I say something about, sorry, about the yeah, process? Go ahead, sorry. So, so that age process, is it a relocation or could assets be coming into the market? Or, um, and then the second thing is, why did you do that instead of maybe having like a target, you know, uh, holdings and then you shock the target holding rather than just reach, you know. Well, that's a great, very intuitive um, uh, idea of shocking the target holdings. In fact, we show in the paper <clears throat> that in, rather than shocking the inventory levels, it's equivalent in terms of results uh, to, to shock the, um, uh, it's actually a shock to the shadow price of holding inventory. Uh, w which amounts to the same thing that you just described. So that's one another way of viewing it. The reason we put it this way is that we're thinking of the large investors as broker dealers that are laying off positions in an interdealer market, which are two of the prominent examples I mentioned earlier on. And you can think of these uh, broker dealers as trading interest rate swaps or treasuries. They're getting customer orders all the time, and they're going to negotiate those orders bilaterally, and now they have extra inventory that they want to lay off in the interdealer um, exchange market. Uh, and so that, that was, uh, we thought, the most natural motivation. But the, uh, the alternative of uh, shocking preferences uh, or, or inventory costs also works. OK, so um, next, the demand function submission game. So we want a game in which the individual investors submit demand functions or equivalently packages of limit orders so that um, the function uh, submitted by trader I at time T in state of the world omega, if the price turned out to be P, would demand the quantity DIT omega P. So this is a function. Everyone's submitting functions. And then uh, given a function and given uh, an exchange price process fee, the total payment by trader I in state of the world omega is just this time integral. This is pretty standard in demand function submission games. Uh, the closest analog to the model that we're doing um, comes out of a paper by Du and Ju, uh, but they did it in discrete time. The associated excess inventory process, once you fold in the uh, inventory shocks, is given on the bottom of this screen. It's just the initial position 
plus how much you purchased on exchanges, plus your inventory shock. And that would be it if you didn't have size discovery, but now we're gonna have size discovery. Before that, just to mention, as I did earlier, there is prior work uh, that shows that in this setting or settings like this, um, uh, individual traders are gonna internalize their price impact and uh, they're not going to trade quickly to the efficient allocation. Okay, finally, we get to the size discovery sessions. So first, these are gonna be held at Poisson times with some mean frequency lambda. Keep track of that parameter lambda. That's basically how much size discovery you wanna do. If you dial lambda up, more size discovery. If you dial it down, or as Pierre Olivier said, you dial it down to zero, less size discovery. So, so Darryl, the, the, the fact that the demand function is linear, is that the result or an assumption? That is a result. So uh, let me go back to that. It's a result that if every trader believes that every other trader will use a demand function of this form, then trader J or trader I will also use a demand function of this form. It's, you're not restricted to be using linear demand functions. That said, we're only looking at equilibria in which um, there are linear demand functions. We're not looking for nonlinear equilibria. There may be some. Um, okay, so what about these size discovery sessions? What, you know, what are they? Well, they're made up of every one of them is, uh, uh, every design is a pair, T-I-Y-I, which says how much cash does Mr. I get based on everyone's report, that's T-I, cash transfer, and how much asset transfer does Mr. I get based on everyone's reports, and that's Y-I. And I already gave you the linear quadratic mechanism, although I, I admit I went through it very quickly. But there are several other mechanisms that have the same properties that I'm about to provide you other than uh, the um, uh, dominant strategy uh, truth-telling property that, that I mentioned earlier. So the, uh, among, the, among the other strategies, well, Volration actually works. In this case though, with the Volration allocation in which you just pay for what you get um, you the natural way to model this is there's no trade unless everyone reports a market clearing allocation and uh, so that means basically it's uh, subject to a lack of robustness so in order to introduce robustness just as is done in practice we looked at rationing based dark pools so that if if there is an excess demand to buy or an excess demand to sell, there's some rationing. And in the paper, we do two different rationing schemes. One is an additive scheme, and one is the more conventional scheme that's done in practice, which is proportional rationing. And I haven't written out the rationing expressions. They're, they're kind of ugly, but they're exactly what's done in practice. And all four of these schemes have the properties that um, I'm about to describe for the equilibrium. And uh, uh, only the linear quadratic scheme has this extra, uh, these extra nice features, but it's also more complicated. In equal, and this is, the next property is crucial. In equilibrium, the average excess inventory can be inferred from the exchange price on the equilibrium path. Now, there, we allow for off the equilibrium path behavior, but uh, the, it's crucial that on the equilibrium path, the exchange price actually reveals the average excess inventory. So all of these schemes become easily implementable. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to, go uh, to the main results in just a moment, unless there are any questions. This would be a good opportunity no, for actually, any clarifying no, questions. So Daryl, within each dark pool, you're getting efficiency. The inefficiency in some sense is coming because you're looking ex ante at what happens in the exchange, given that there's a dark pool exposed. Is, is that correct? That, yeah, the inefficiency comes from the fact that everyone says, oh, it's so good for me that I can wait until this dark pool is gonna happen. That means that I, um, I don't need to incur price impact costs on the exchange. I can just wait. And when it happens, I'm gonna unload a big lump of excess inventory at that time. And everybody feels the same way. That's the source of inefficiency. That plus the fact that they don't want to trade 
aggressively because they could push the dark pool price uh, against themselves because the dark pool price is based on the exchange price. So there's two sources of inefficiency. And uh, as I mentioned in answer to an earlier question, while our model is extremely limited and in some respects artificial, for example, on the uh, modeling of inventory costs, the uh, intuition for those two uh, sources of market inefficiency, waiting and not wanting to push the price, um, are both universal. Uh, so now the question is, quantitatively, will the results be a lot different if you have a different model? Um, may I ask a question? Yes, Marcena, please. So if traders' risk preferences were heterogeneous, the ability to infer Z-bar would change and there will be an additional risk component in the value function which would affect the trade of your machine in the beginning. Have you? Yeah, that's that? right. Um, and you know, way back in the early stages of this uh, project, Sam and I looked at the case of heterogeneous agents, motivated in part by your results, which show that uh, with heterogeneous agents, sometimes you can get un unexpected improvements in efficiency uh, in, a different, in a different context. Unfortunately, and as shown by a paper by Andy Skripich and Yuli Senikov, the uh, case with heterogeneous risk preferences is essentially intractable. So we would like to be able to give you results for that, uh, for that case, but but cannot. We just don't know how to solve the, uh, a model uh, that allows for heterogeneity. There are one, one quick question. So um, I, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm searching for like a, maybe a more, uh, another efficiency benchmark. So this is like a dynamic mechanism design problem, right? You could have, you know, a planner who gets reports from agents continuously and keeps announcing allocations and doing that. What you're doing here is, you know, in these uh, discovery sessions, there is a structure that's imposed that comes from the linear demand uh, uh, schedule assumption. Um, is the other problem just completely like, you know, off the table in terms of uh, tractability? Venki, it's, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I'm, I'm remiss in not having raised the, the larger perspective on what we're doing in this paper. One could just basically scrape the entire uh, current financial market structure and say, starting from scratch, yeah. let's not necessarily inter have exchanges or necessarily have uh, size discovery sessions that happen at some points in time, like we do in practice. We could start from scratch and uh, develop some cross time, um, uh, let's say mechanism design that uses what you've traded in the past, what market, if there is market prices at all, uh, what market prices have done in the past and compensate you for being an aggressive trader the next time we, we do something. And maybe we could do much better uh, than anything that um, is on the table today, including the introduction of size discovery. Um, and I think that's a really good project. Sam and I have not uh, done that. We've um, maybe been conservative in the sense that we're not taking a normative approach to market design. We're looking at the current market design and taking it as a given that we're not gonna scrape the exchange markets, they're probably gonna be there, and, it, and uh, placing some focus on the current approach of doing size discovery, which the essence of which is every once in a while, look at what the exchange price that you got from the exchange is, freeze that price, and let traders make some reports and make allocations to them based on their reports. They all work the same way. And what we want to know is, is adding that feature of occasional size discovery uh, sessions a good idea for allocative efficiency or not? That's much less ambitious than the project that you outlined, which would be start from scratch. Maybe you can do something way better. One example might be, uh, you know, if, uh, if Venki trades a lot over the last month, we'll give him some credits, some points, and he can use those right. uh, to, to some benefit. And the next time we do size discovery, uh, and uh, that, that could be potentially superior. So, that so said, I, a more, I mean, yeah. I agree. I, I mean, my scope wasn't that, um, wasn't that ambitious either. I was more kind of gumming at this from the perspective of maybe the problem 
isn't the size discovery sessions per se, but what happens on the exchanges. In other words, maybe if you modify the exchange protocol a little bit, you know, the size discovery sessions might become um, desirable again. And that's the dimension. So I was not thinking about completely scrapping the exchanges. I was just trying to see if there's something really missing in the way exchanges are organized or in your setting, in the way the linear demand schedules are organized. Um, yeah. That's making so, size discovery undesirable. Well, so I think I, you're asking exactly the right questions. And one of the things we don't do, although we discuss it at the end of the paper, is the industrial organization problem associated with right. what you just described. The problem is going to be, and we discussed this, if some exchange comes along and says, look, we'll offer a size discovery, but we're gonna modify our exchange process, or we're gonna modify our size discovery process so that they work better together and provide better incentives for everyone, so come to us. Then another size discovery platform, you know, Martsena could say, well, I'm setting up shop over here and you don't have to do any of that stuff that Daryl's right. doing. Right. You can trade at our platform right. and we'll steal the price from right. Daryl's exchange. Right. At no charge, you can use it. Uh, so the, you know, it would it would just, uh, potentially take um, pretty yeah. significant regulation. And right now, I wouldn't design a regulation based only on our paper for the reasons that I've described. It it's limited, but I think it points directionally uh, yeah. towards a much deeper look. Thank you. Okay, so much. I'm going to move. Yeah. I'm going to move along pretty quickly because now I'm approaching the point at which if I don't move along rapidly through to the end, I'm going to run out of time for sure. So let's just put everything together now and talk about uh, the main results. So the main, in the, the main model combining everything is trader I's position at time T is the initial position plus how much exchange trading uh, trader I has done plus the additional amount that trader I got was allocated in size discovery sessions which happen every time that Poisson process N clicks up by one plus the inventory shocks uh, for trader I. And then trader I faces this stochastic control problem, which is literally how we formulate it in the paper, maximize over demand functions and uh, reports into size discovery, the total expected utility, which is final asset payoff, less how much you paid for exchange purchases, plus how much cash you got transferred in size discovery, minus your inventory holding costs. We set up the conjectured uh, solution to this problem, which is the indirect utility I mentioned earlier. We verify the, um, HJ, the, the solution for the HJB equation is indeed the value function. And then we just look at the properties of the equilibrium that results. Uh, uh, of course, in equilibrium is market clearing. Everyone's consistently conjecturing what everybody else is doing. Everybody is individually optimizing, including uh, incentive compatibility and uh, uh, individual rationality. A main result, finally. So if your frequency of size discovery sessions is bigger than some constant lambda bar that we analyze in the paper, Exchange trading just breaks down. Everyone says, wow, uh, we're having size discovery so often that I am gonna flatten my demand in the exchange market to the point where the market can, cannot even clear. So forget about it. Can't have, there's an upper bound on size discovery because of this effect of everyone defecting away from exchange trading. Now, if you pick a size discovery frequency lambda below this upper bound, there are actually two linear equilibria of the type that I described. And I'm only gonna characterize the less, pardon me, the more efficient of the two, because that's when I'm, when I'm, when we are saying that size discovery is not efficient, uh, the, we wanna to compare to the most efficient version of it, which is the equilibrium uh, with better welfare and size discovery. In that more efficient equilibrium, every single trader's value is strictly decreasing in the frequency of size discovery. So uh, put it another way, ex ante, every trader given the opportunity to vote against size discovery would say, I vote against size discovery, none of it please. Now, once it's introduced, of course they'll want to trade in it. So this is a, this is a kind of tragedy of the commons in which everyone would be better off without it, but everyone is happy to participate if it's present. Uh, I already showed that picture. 
And I'm going to finish with um, this last slide on some policy related observations, which to some extent have already come up. So I'll, I'll, slow, down a bit, I'll slow down a bit now and then we'll have a discussion um, right, after, right after this slide. So uh, we don't analyze the industrial organization of this market, but based on our results, you can see that if you had competing platform operators, the entry of a size discovery platform is going to be profitable in this setting. But uh, at least in our model, it's going to be socially harmful. That's first conclusion. Secondly, as size discovery sessions become more frequent, exchange volume and, and market depth both decline. Thirdly, if size discovery is available, traders will use it, even though they're better off in our model if it, uh, if it didn't exist. Fourth, scope for regulation. And MIFID II made a run at a regulation that would limit the amount of size discovery of a specific form. Uh, but there's been an end run, as I mentioned earlier, on that regulation. And they're rethinking what they, uh, in Europe, what they can do. The United States has not really um, uh, discussed, um, um, well, it's discussed the harm. SEC actually has a paper on the potential harm of this, but there's been nothing like a regulatory action or proposed uh, action in this area. And as I mentioned, the policy re uh, relevant empirical evidence that we have is limited to the equities market, which is probably the, the least um, close to our model because of the uh, implications for asymmetric information about asset payoffs in the equities market. Uh, and also the use of size discovery in equities while large is not nearly as large as in uh, treasuries or swap markets. And moreover, uh, that policy relevant empirical evidence is mixed. I would, I would, you know, maybe in my biased state, I would say if you read all those papers, you'd probably conclude as I do that the evidence is roughly against allowing size discovery in the equities market, but you wouldn't be able to um, uh, claim that that conclusion is a strong one. Uh, so I, I would say, there's also a scope for a, a more empirical work on this problem. And that's the, that's the end of uh, my prepared remarks. And now we have time for a discussion. We're right on the top of the hour. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Uh, before I start the discussion, I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you want to uh, have a, if you have a question, you can use your raise your hand feature from the uh, from Zoom, and uh, we, that's also true for the attendees, and we try to go to as many questions as we can. Um, hi, Daryl. I've got a, a question uh, with the double the continuous time double auction. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, the you focus on the kind of a smooth equilibrium where everyone submits a demand schedule, demand function in continuous time and in infinitesimal amount of time, they trade an infinitesimal amount of quantity. Have you considered alternative equilibrium where let's say everyone agrees to only submit demand schedule, lump sum demand schedules at fixed times, deterministic fixed time, discrete times, and maybe that could be more efficient. That's a, a, a good idea. In fact, there's some prior work um, by Hao Shang Ju and his co-author Du that consider the optimal timing in discrete time of sizes, uh, not sizes, well, they, they do it of exchange trading. Not, there's no size discovery in that paper. Sam and I um, uh, tried to be thorough and uh, we, we did actually, there's a full appendix on the discrete time version of this model. And the only reason that it's not the main version of the model is that the results are, uh, don't look as analytically clean. Uh, but the discrete time model is there. In fact, you get a little bit more because you can, because of discrete time, you can show sub game perfection in discrete time where it's hard to do that in, in, the, in the continuous time model. And moreover, the discrete time model converges to the continuous time model um, as, time in, as time intervals uh, get uh, shorter. So um, now it would, might be different if you had endogenous discrete times. Um, but in practice, I don't think that's, uh, that's a dominant practice. I would say though that uh, there's been an increased incidence, Albert probably knows more about this than any of us, of uh, within day uh, 
uh, point in time double auctions. Um, uh, uh, that might be more effective. So it's it's kind of so. Let, let me remind everybody what this means. That in some exchanges there's an opening auction. On some exchanges there's a closing auction. I would say there's a slight tendency over time for more exchanges to introduce auctions in the middle of the day, maybe two or three. And remember, an auction uh, is not like a size discovery session. You're not relying on a fixed price that you're lifting from the exchange. So there could be a potential improvement um, from introducing intraday uh, double auctions. And there is some work uh, in a different context by Budish, Crampton, and Shim that shows that we're, we're probably running exchanges too, too frequently and that if you had occasional batch auctions, you could do better. That's not related to our work because we're not doing any sniping or anything like that. But I would I say that uh, uh, more work on the timing of auctions consistent with your question would be a good idea. I see Bruno has his hand up. Yes, I, I, I agree with what you said. It, and also in, in a sense that was already shown in the paper by Dimitri. The paper by Dimitri, the one you quoted, the one from 1999, shows that you don't want to trade too often. You, uh, it's not good to have continuous market. You, you would like to have more time between transactions. So in a sense that, that predates Buddhist by a long, long time. <laughs> uh, I was also... Uh, Okay, Sorry, I'm sure No, just a Vish has, has his hands up. Uh, yeah, so, I guess, uh, Daryl, one question is, uh, I don't know of any practical instances where operators of price discovery have to pay the exchange because they use the exchange price. But do you think there'd be any welfare improvement if we forced price discovery uh, operators to make payments to the exchange for using the price? Would that be like a first order improvement? It's an interesting idea. Um, Can I piggyback on that? No. Yeah, yeah, Ricardo, maybe you have a, I don't have an immediately good answer. I mean, it sounds appealing, but now the mechanism that one would use that uh, where, where the incentives, the incentives uh, that would be created, um, I, I have a hard time figuring out whether it's gonna help. Ricardo, do you have a view? No, I wanted to actually uh, uh, augment Vish's question that I was thinking the whole time. So you're going to so make it <laughs> Yeah, right. No, I mean, you could imagine letting uh, the people pay to accelerate the discovery session. So one of your problems is delay. So you can imagine, you know, you can pull a trigger and then that speeds up your Poisson process. Uh, but there's a price and, you know, you pay for that. And I was trying, you know, anyways, it's related to Vish's question a little bit. Uh, That's an interesting one because then you're internalizing the cost of accelerating yeah, right, uh, right. the size discovery. Right. Uh, remember that there is an upper bound on how fast it can run because everybody else will then not submit on the exchange. Uh, but maybe if the, if you have a price uh, that's high enough, that's right. you would improve on what we're currently doing. You'd have to recirculate the cost of uh, these fees uh, back to the market somehow so that you'd incur, you may be using them like in a paper by Anthony Jong and uh, um, um, forgetting who, oh, um, uh, Daniel, Daniel Chen and Anthony Jong have a paper in which if you provide fees to market participants in an auction uh, for more aggressive trading, then you'll get an improvement in allocation. So maybe you could recirculate those fees back to the exchange uh, for, uh, to incent uh, more aggressive trading and you would end up being better off. As, as I mentioned in answer to a, an earlier question, I can't remember who asked it. By Venki. Venki was asking Venky the question asked, about yeah. mechanism. If you, open yeah. up, if you open up the whole game, uh, there are all kinds of interesting possibilities arise, but you do have to be careful of entry because somebody else, you know, Bruno could say, well, come to, my, come to my platform. We don't do any of those things where you have to pay for stuff. We just lift the price off the exchange because it's a public good. Yeah, but, but still, I, 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 it's true that competition, you know, if you can compete and, and cannot be regulated, then it's going to be hard to regulate you. But <laughs> I think that uh, in a sense, the, uh, the fundamental market failure that we have here is, is a form of externality, you know, a form of informational externality. I, I don't want to provide information about my own type. Um, and so, you know, and, and so it seems to me very much in the line of what Venki was saying that uh, we need something, some sort of 
Pigovian taxation to, uh, to try to reduce the externality problem. And um, so the, the things that have been suggested, like you know, making people pay for using the price, may be, in a sense, understood as a form of Pigovian taxation. But I believe that uh, the optimal taxation in this setting should depend on how much I traded. So you know, if, if I don't buy a lot, and then I show up at the, uh, at the session and I buy an enormous amount, uh, I, I, I think the planner should be upset with me. And there should, there should be a form of, of, of Pigovian taxation on that. Yeah, in addition to price-based um, uh, regulation, you could imagine quantity-based regulations yes. like the MIFID II, but, but at least in the United States and Europe, we have so many different ways to do an end run on these regulations with internal crossing and other methods that um, you know, uh, you're gonna have to tighten up uh, reporting and, uh, and, the and the ways that platforms are done, internal crossing by broker dealers a lot before you're not gonna get leakage, significant leakage once you start applying a Pagovian tax. So Albert has I, a question. Yeah. So um, I, I, this is uh, wonderful. I think I've seen a, a version of it before when you were in Rotterdam. Um, and I want to come back to what Pierre Olivier uh, raised a while ago is the, uh, is the unpredictability. Uh, I understand that you need it for tractability reasons. Uh, but in some sense, if you look at the auctions that indeed some exchanges run within a day, they are at fixed times for a reason also because it creates some predictability in a way for people that that are in the market for allocated, allocated reasons to meet at the same time, right? So, so I mean, it's sort of an externality that you, that you have there. If I participate at 12 o'clock and you know that I'm there, you're gonna be there too. Um, now you're saying this is not size discovery because it's an auction, that, that's true. But I, I sort of like that part of it, even in your setting, if there is some predictability, there should be ways, uh, for if it's costly to participate in the market all the time, uh, to create some uh, some allocative efficiency by the simple fact that I know when to be in the market. Okay, that's a great question. And Sam and I have thought about that. Um, and we've come to the following conclusion, although we haven't got proofs of, of all details. Remember, uh, let me start, and this is really interesting. Remember that if you increase the frequency of size discovery beyond some point, the exchange market breaks down because everyone is saying, ah, oh, it won't be very long in expectation until there's a size discovery. I'm not gonna do any trading I'm not gonna express a demand function with any slope on the exchange. I'm just gonna wait for size discovery. Now, keep that in the back of your mind and say, we're gonna have a size discovery at noon today. And it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning, people are gonna be trading because they're gonna say, well, it's a long time till noon, I better not wait yet. But by maybe 9.15, they're gonna say, you know what? It's close enough to noon that I should wait. From now on until noon, I'm not gonna express any um, uh, slope to my demand function and the whole exchange market will stop trading from 9.15 until noon. Then you'll get an explosion of trade at noon on size discovery. Then the exchange will open again until maybe 2.15 and then everyone says, ah, they're going to do a size discovery at 4.30 at in the afternoon. I'm going to stop. And so you'll get these intermittent stop starts uh, where there's no exchange price. Of course, that means that when you hold the size discovery at 4.30 in the afternoon, you're using the 2.15 stale price because that's the latest one you have. So the, overall, that's bad news. On the other hand, having a, a double auction at noon um, probably would not have that problem because you're not relying on the exchange price and the, you're still going to get uh, price impact. Uh, but I haven't, we haven't analyzed that. So I think, more, as I said, more attention to intraday um, uh, double auctions um, seems like a good re research direction. Miguel, um, just a, kind of taking this in a different direction, right? I mean, if, if you look at what a lot of the equity crossing networks, if you want to think of those as, as price discovery did, they went to continuous right auctions in the sense that you would leave your order with the crossing network. And how long you leave the order would be the decision you would make. And then someone else sends their order in. And if they hit another order, that's great. Now they have to decide how long they leave their order in. And that's, you know, most, m many, I can't say all because there's so many, but 
most of the crossing networks went away from discrete times and went to continuous trading, which if you think about it, is kind of interesting because now the decision is how long do I leave my order in the crossing network in the hope that I'm gonna run into somebody else. And going back to Albert's point, I think Albert's point's a great one, except that the reality in a lot of market settings is the manipulation. Right. If, if I know there's going to be a crossing network at 12, then I screw the price up at 1159 point whatever. And so, again, most of the crossing networks that, that, that I was familiar with, they use random times exactly for that reason. But the continuous crossing is one that's an alternative direction to go. That's kind of interesting. I think it would be fantastic to uh, uh, to think about that. So if I understand you, Maureen. The exchange is running all the time. And in the background, individual traders can say, well, I might incur some price impact. I'm going to set aside some of my order into the crossing network. And then if somebody else comes along um, up until two in the afternoon, I'll be willing to exchange at the most recent market price. Is that how it works? Kind of. I mean, what you generally see, I mean, in at least in equities, uh, most people start their day dumping orders into the crossing network right? Because if they can cross first thing in the morning, that's what they want to do. And then, uh, you know, because most traders have to trade by a certain time horizon, right? And, and so for some traders, it's an hour. For some traders, it's a day. And so depending on their time horizon, it's really sort of how long are they going to leave this in these networks? And so it, it creates very interesting patterns across the day because it, it captures the fact that there are intraday patterns in trading and those show up in the patterns in the crossings as well. Yeah, so let me take a wild guess that if you can keep your uh, position in the crossing network completely private, that that subject, that, that, that is analytically tractable and that it has the same negative features that we described, although it may not be overall negative for welfare, but it still has the property A, that you, um, are taking depth away from the market in an adverse manner. And the more you do it, the more everybody else wants to do it because the market's getting even less deep. And B, you're going to be cautious in the meantime um, about pushing the price um, because you don't want the exchange price to be bad when your crossing order gets done. Now, whether or not that design is is better than the one um, uh, uh, with point in time size discovery, uh, it's a good question because you're diversifying away some of the uh, lump, lumpiness. Uh, it's, it's, I think that would be a really neat one to investigate. And in just like one minute, I have to get off because I'm giving a talk on treasury markets at the Atlanta Fed at, the, at 1030, my time. Uh, but if, if there's any other uh, so there, last questions. There's no last like question the, from Shane. Shane, she had raised his hand a, a time ago. So let's okay, try. Great. So I just have a probably very uh, not very fair question. So uh, intuitive, I thought dealer have uh, this precautionary motive to hold inventory to ward off some uncertainty. And I thought this exchange, uh, this this new mechanism can reduce uh, dealers' incentive to hold a, hold back inventory. And but to capture that uh, precautionary motive, one needs maybe sort of uh, not quadratic utility function, but some um, more with a utility function with a negative third derivative or something. So I, I was just wondering if it's, uh, it'd be interesting to um, extend the model to allow more general utility function. Definitely interesting. Um, the quadratic one, as I mentioned, is a weakness of our paper. The benefit is that you take a derivative of a quadratic, you get a linear and linear yeah. works in these kinds of settings. And that's, uh, you know, the, the Omgren Crisp model goes back to around 2000 and it was used for a little while in industry in, in the in, uh, financial industry uh, in doing optimal order execution as a model for inventory costs. But within some years, um, it's been supplanted in industry applications by uh, somewhat different models. And I think, you know, the latest is instead of power two, it's like power 1.3 or something like that. Uh, so, um, so I don't know the answer to your question, Shengxing, um, but I, I, would, I would love to be able to solve that model, but 
um, so far unable. Sam, do you have anything to, uh, to add to uh, what's been said before we uh, shut down for today? No, I think you've, uh, you've covered everything very well. <laughs> what a great co-author. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you everybody for coming for this talk. Uh, there has to go now. Uh, people are welcome to stay a little bit and chat here if, if you, you would like to. Uh, it's always fun to, to, to talk. Uh, but thank you again, there for, for, for your talk. That was an awesome opportunity, Bruno. What a, uh, as I said, what an amazing group yeah. of people that you pulled together. Uh, yeah. For yeah. Thank you for all the panelists, project. too. For all the experts are here. Yeah, thank you all the panelists. Yeah, thank you all for the great feedback. Thank you.